Welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to see you all here virtually. My name is David Macy. I'm a professor of English and the interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts here at the University of Central Oklahoma. It is my pleasure to welcome, first of all, our very distinguished poet and guest, Laylee Bong Soldier. Welcome. On behalf of the Creative Writing Program, the Department of English and the College of Liberal Arts. Um, we are honored to be able to host this important event to hear some very powerful poetry. And I will, rather than monopolizing your time, now introduce my colleague, another distinguished poet and our 2021-2022 artist in residence here on campus, Dr. Wendy Barnes, who will introduce our special guest and speak a few words of introduction. So Dr. Barnes, I cede the virtual floor to you. Thank you, Dr. Macy. We are thrilled to welcome you, Laylee Long Soldier, and just beyond appreciative that you've taken time to share your work with us tonight. I'd also like to thank Dean Macy and the College of Liberal Arts for their support of the event. Thanks also to the Department of English and our chair, Dr. Amanda Putnam, to Dr. Connie Squires, the director of the MA in Creative Writing Program. And thanks too to Dr. Timothy Petit for his contributions to organizing the event. I wanna mention before we continue with introductions that we'll be taking questions from the chat for maybe 10 or 15 minutes after the reading. Feel free to enter them at any time. We probably won't get to all of them, but we will get to some. Laylee Long Soldier holds a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and an MFA from Bard College. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, The New York Times, The American Poet, The American Reader, The Kenyan Review, Bomb, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of an NACF National Artist Fellowship, a Lannan Literary Fellowship, a Whiting Award, and was a finalist for the 2017 National Book Award. She has also received the 2018 Penn Jean Stein Award, the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award, a 2021 Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Literature, and the 2021 Michael Murphy Memorial Poetry Prize in the UK. She is the author of Chromosomery, Q Avenue Press, and Whereas, Grey Wolf Press. She resides in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We'll now hear a word from BA candidate in creative writing, Justin Wood. Thank you. Nathagi uh, Okema. I'm Jess Wood. I'm the chief of the Sac and Fox Nation. I'm also a major creative writing major at the University of Central Oklahoma. The Sac and Fox Nation is a sovereign indigenous tribe that stretches from Shawnee through Stroud to Cushing in Oklahoma. Our borders are the Cimarron, Deep Fork, and North Canadian rivers. And it is my distinct honor to welcome both, uh, to welcome you all uh, here today, tonight. Um, in a world where pundits often argue over our differences, tonight we are all brought together to observe the work of Laylee Long Soldier, a citizen of the Ogla Lakota Nation. In fact, her work serves as a unifying purpose in, in many ways. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Wendy Barnes for her willingness to invest in her students' lives and for inviting Laylee Long Soldier to read for the University of Central Oklahoma students and many other interested people across the state and as we see in the chat from across the world. As a citizen of the Sac and Fox Nation, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to celebrate an indigenous poet. Long Soldier's writing brilliantly encapsulates the shared resilience of indigenous people in America. She addresses the socioeconomic and political problems faced by our indigenous tribes in a way that is both identifiable and unique. Both her poems, but her poems are so impactful that you need not be native to appreciate and maybe even begin to understand uh, the problems faced by our indigenous tribes, the past and current experience of native people. She takes the reader to vulnerable places with a stark sense of reality. Her use of vivid imagery and attention to language make both the individual and communal experiences she portrays come alive 
uh, for Native and non-Native audiences alike. So thank you to Laylee Long Soldier for her tremendous work and for sharing her work and knowledge with our university community. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Laylee Long Soldier's book, Whereas, is one of the most lauded and discussed volumes of poetry published in the US in recent years. It has been described as a book that contends with the bureaucratic language used by the US government in official apologies to Native Americans and in treaties and legislation. The book exposes the inadequacies of this language, its hypocrisies, and the ways it is used to inscribe power and inflict violence upon Native people and their cultures. Long Soldier directly engages the 2009 Congressional Resolution of Apology to Native Americans, signed by President Obama behind closed doors. And as she notes, no tribal leaders or official representatives were invited to witness and receive the apology on behalf of tribal nations. This is a book of protest, but Long Soldier has said that she hopes the book also creates a place of belonging, not only a place of resistance. Here, the English language itself is a hostile one, a language of occupation. Long Soldier's poems begin to infiltrate and dismantle that language with Lakota words, her own wordplay and inventive syntax, turning the dominant language against itself. But at the same time, her innovations open the language to moments of kindness, beauty, even forgiveness. This is but one of the ways the book creates a new space for potential gathering, reclamation, and solidarity. In recent years, institutions across North America, like ours, have issued land acknowledgments, some composed with and some composed without the contributions of tribal representatives. At their best, such statements are not mere gestures, but genuine attempts to recognize that the land we occupy is still disputed territory. These declarations are themselves subject to the same kinds of indictments that Long Soldier has leveled at legislation and congressional pronouncements. Whereas questions whether this language of violence can ever be adequate to account for its own history and the crimes it has facilitated. I will now read our UCO land acknowledgement. The University of Central Oklahoma recognizes that we gather on land entrusted to the care and protection of the Caddo and Wichita peoples. These lands are part of the wider state of Oklahoma, which is shared by the 39 sovereign indigenous nations, including the Kiowa, Comanche, Osage, Apache, and Fort Sill Apache nations, and is associated with the forced relocation of nations through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. The university was built in unassigned land with seized portions of Indian territory taken from the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole nations by the federal government in 1866. Beginning in 1889, this land was distributed through several land runs intended to confine and erase indigenous peoples from this territory. We acknowledge the historical events that have and continue to affect indigenous people of this land. We pledge to honor and respect indigenous knowledges and worldviews as we sustain a meaningful relationship with the sovereign nations. I want to make one last point about her work before turning it over to Lely. When I read a book by one of our best poets, I ask myself, how has this book pushed the art forward? Because that's what the best books do. Has it in some way invented its language? Does its form innovate according to its own necessities? Does it urgently frame its vision? Has it girded its voice with the courage to speak its conscience? Is its spirit uniquely generous? Laylee Long Soldier's work reminds us that some poets can advance the art in many ways at once, 
propelling it in a new direction. And in her case, into a space that seems utterly original and entirely undefined, except by the presence of her own work there. I am so grateful for it, and we are grateful to have her with us tonight. Please welcome Lely Long Soldier. Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for such a welcoming, such a warm uh, welcome. So it, I'm really happy to be here. And um, I, uh, I'm gonna try something new with you guys. I'm going to actually, I'm not gonna read uh, just regular poems. I'm not reading from whereas. Tonight I'm gonna read some new work. Um, and it's actually, the first part is an essay and the second part is like a hybrid form. Um, there's lots of photos and um, um, I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's like a hybrid poem or a hybrid essay, we'll see. But um, I only have 30 minutes. So uh, I will actually cannot read the whole essay. The whole essay would take me about almost an hour. <laughs> But we'll see how much I can do within the allotted time. And I'm actually going to share screen uh, so that you can follow along, uh, at least for me on Zoom events. Um, my attention can wander. I'm at home. There's so many things going on. So I'm going to put the text on the screen so that you can follow uh, just in case, um, just in case that's helpful. It helps me sometimes. I'm going to start. Might as well start, right? Okay. And I forgot to introduce myself. Leili Akichi Tahanska, Emachiapi, Daya Hipina Chante, Washte, Nabe Chiyuzapi. So I just wanted to say hello. I come with a good heart, a warm hand, especially, especially if we have any Lakota speakers here. Um, I just wanted to greet you in our language. Uh, okay, I'm going to start. Here we go. Uh, now you will listen. Reflections on U.S. educational experiences through generations. My kid, a teenager, they had a midterm project due the next morning, and oh my God, why did they wait until the night before? It's their sophomore year in high school. I knew my kid was not pleased with the assignment but I kept quiet as they figured it out on their own. There were three choices for midterm assignments. Among them, one was especially troubling. Students were asked to watch a YouTube video titled as, quote, strange foods of a certain Asian country. Answer a questionnaire about the video, then research and write about foods of their own choosing from other nations or cultures. My kid purposefully chose to work with this video because there was something that couldn't be overlooked, central to how the school discusses, quote, other cultures. My kid paced the living room and ran ideas past me, searching for the words to address a distasteful American lens, exemplified literally and figuratively in this video, through which my child refuses to view the world. I lay on the couch as, quote, moral support, waiting as the living room lights seem to glow lower and lower, as my eyes blinked for longer, more luxurious moments until they finally blissfully shut. Then at 3 a.m., God help me, my kid asked me to read their work. Oh my God, I wanted to die. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have teenagers, but parenting one is an adventure. So that's all I have to say. I want to share a few positive notes. So I'll begin with what my kid wrote about land, culture, and the ingredients for Diné blue corn mush and Hopi peaky bread. Hopi peaky bread. 
Uh, my kid is Diné on their paternal side and grew up on the Navajo Nation. So this was a natural fit. First, I commended the recognition of the Diné and Hopi nations as sovereign and therefore perfectly suited for a world history assignment. Secondly, these nations are neighbors to each other, sharing similar landscape, vegetation, and climate. Blue corn mush and peaky bread require the same three ingredients, blue cornmeal, water, and juniper ash. Yet, they are prepared in different forms, alternate expressions of the same ingredients. Excellent observation, I say. <clears throat> I don't know if we have any Dana or Hopi students with, uh, with us tonight, but um, maybe you uh, are thinking about your homeland and <laughs> those foods. But anyway, here we go. But the first half of my kids' paper critiqued the teacher's midterm assignment itself. This is more difficult to discuss because recounting the details of what happens next drains energy rather than gives energy. Sometimes I think to myself, I am already so tired must I really relive the details of an experience to be understood? Perhaps I am hoping the effort is worth it. I'm always asking, is it worth it? But this is another conversation. In any case, the video was, quote, belittling, quote, bigoted, and made a spectacle of other cultures' foods. This is what my kid wrote. Oh my God. At 3 a.m., I was tired, oh yes. After giving the essay a quick once over, I could have suggested changes to soften the language, to shift the tone, to avoid offending the teacher, which would probably reduce backlash and stress for my child, et cetera, and so on. It's a lot to think about these strategies, but I didn't suggest any changes because the observations were true. It would be more interesting to keep things simple, let my kids speak honestly in their own words and allow the teacher to receive it as is. But this is 10th grade, so I wanted to assume that, you know, 10th grade teachers know that their students are still learning. <laughs> They're st still learning how to be critical, still, still learning the language to use, you know. The language would be hard for the teacher to swallow. I knew this. Admittedly, my child grew up with two parents who are poets and educators. So they know the power of language too. It was no surprise, therefore, to find out that the critique was hard to hear. And when they finished reading the paper out loud in the classroom, the teacher said that she in turn felt, quote, belittled by my kid's presentation. A ratio was created. Belittled, belittled. This dialogue in the classroom created ripples, noticeably so, sparking heated discussion and chatter, classmates' eyes on their face, until my kid walked the halls after class to the school bathroom to text me from a stall, crying, feeling what it is to really be little, a hard lesson in world history, a lesson I learned at that age too. 
When I'm feeling emotional, I like to write about writing. It's called the reflexive, right? I like to write about writing. I do this instinctively. I soothe myself into the world of making. I feel at peace. For example, the text size in the previous paragraph creates a shapely feeling. It therefore contributes to form, which I give a lot of thought to. Already, this piece has taken several forms. I cannot decide if it works best in prose blocks, in couplets, or as loose organic paragraphs. You guys, I actually separated this whole essay into couplets at one time. <laughs> I just wanted to see what it how it would work, but it didn't work, just letting you know. Anyway, with patience, it will find its proper shape. A period could arrive as a comma leaves. Sentences slip into short, lucid dreams. Because one word creates a new life, I'm sure of this. From that moment forward, I view a written piece as a being with its own needs. The piece will tell me when, how, where to break a line. It will sometimes ask me to listen in the middle of the night. And so tonight, Although my eyes are raw, I get out of bed to come to the page, to write about ripples radiating into the following week at my kids' school, when the same teachers use the words S-A-V-A-G-E and R-E-D-S-K-I-N in a lesson about colonialism and imperialism. Upon receiving a distressing text from my kid, again, again, I rushed in brisk, steely strides to the school's front office for an impromptu meeting with the teacher and principal. I was told that these terms were spoken in the context of understanding how language has been used by colonizers historically to dehumanize. The words uttered by this teacher were not intended to be derogatory, nor to dehumanize the students themselves, they explain. This situation is comparable to anaphora, if I were to use poetry lingo, as in the way I'm given explanations. When I confront situations like this, I'm offered familiar words, repetitive, sensible, reasons, certainly no malintent, I'm assured. Everything's from a good place, I'm told. And in the face of these explanations, most times, I drift on ripples out the door, back to my car, to the quiet edge of rage. I'll say this in fairness. I have since corresponded with the teacher and offered to visit her classes to speak about colonization from firsthand Native experience. Uh, perspective, excuse me. I offered this to support the Native students, not her. Our exchange nonetheless has been cordial, careful. Likewise, the piece I'm writing here isn't aimed at dehumanizing the teacher. If the teacher reads this and again feels belittled, or betrayed, or a rise in blood pressure, she might keep in mind that she appears in this piece only 
as a figure to illustrate the subject matter, much like the language used in her classroom. In fact, this piece isn't interested in the teacher much at all. That's what this piece tells me. This piece wants to talk about our young people, my kid and the other Native students who felt sick upon hearing those words in their classroom, who spoke up and bore the blows of white liberal fragility. We are, that's a familiar term these days, but it's very real. This piece wants to talk about our children's bravery and what they in turn have taught me. Our native youth these days do not care about context for uttering dehumanizing words. They don't want to hear that language in their presence. They say they don't want to hear those words. They don't want to hear those words. They don't want to hear those words in the space around them. In Lakota language, the child, the, the word for child is Wakanaja. Forgive my spelling. There are a number of ways to write it. But what's important to know is the root of Wakanaja is Wakha, meaning holy or sacred. Thus, whenever we say the word child in Lakota language, we are calling a child a sacred being. I take that seriously. When I think about a person, a site, or an object that is sacred, I also think about the surrounding space. I've watched how children affect us. In their presence, generally speaking, we are instinctively careful with what we do and say, highly conscious of the language we use. Generally, that is, when we regard them as sacred or when we love them. Because of recent events, we've had several conversations at home on this issue of language and what's okay and what's not okay to say. For example, my kid told me that a trusted native educator, a relative, said that it should be permissible to verbalize certain racial slurs in educational discussions. For example, when an activist gives a presentation, a presentation about offensive team mascots and names. As an educator myself, I have thought about this, I have thought the same thing. So I said, mm, yes, I agree. Then my kids said, well, I don't agree with either of you. I observe my kid and their friends disagree with us, the older generation. They do so fearlessly. If those toxic words must be used, they demand that we say the S word or the R word. In fact, I gave a lecture today and I had, my kid was in the classroom with me here at a Colorado college and I had to say the R word. <laughs> we were discussing Jordan Abel's poetry engine and there's a section with the R word in there. So um, my kiddo was sitting there and I had to um, be mindful. Uh, use the S word or R word, no matter the setting. I observe further, they are making the rules for us now. Now I must listen. Now I am learning. One of the other mothers in the community stepped in. 
She too drove to the school, met with administration and made several demands. For example, she requested that we as native adults be allowed to visit campus on a regular basis to serve as advocates for the native students. We can hear their concerns and give voice when our children do not feel listened to. I was grateful for her advocacy. We need each other, us families. This was an excellent suggestion and my heart broke open as I thanked her. Last night, this after school, this same mother took my child and another student to eat at Sonic, then back to her house to hang out. I was thankful again for her nurturing ways. When I dropped my kid off at Sonic, I walked to the car window to give this mother my friend a hug, and I lingered for a few minutes to thank our young ones seated inside for their bravery. I told them that they are speaking up in the ways that we, the older generation, could not. When I was small, I told them, I was so quiet in the classroom. The prevalence of racism was too powerful. I absorbed all that hurtful language, those attitudes towards Native people, the messages. I took everything home with me, silently, in my body. You think that I'd get stronger as I get older, I told my kid's friend. I was still standing at the car window as the teens ate their fries, etc. But I'm getting weaker as I get older. Can you believe it? This episode at your school really hit me hard, I said. The other night I woke up sweating with a stomach ache and backache. I lay in bed bent sideways like a comma. I knew that nothing, no shift in position, no other bed, no over-the-counter medication would ease the pain. It felt like somehow what happened to you at school brought all my own past and brought back all my own past. This is called the weathering effect, they told me. I gave a whole presentation on that, my kid's friend said. It's like rocks in a backpack. More rocks get put into the backpack as we live through things. We carry them around and they get heavier and heavier with time. If we're not careful, we pass them on to our children. I was astounded. This beautiful young person, a teenager, already knew the language for what happens to us, the chipping away at our minds and bodies, why it hurts more over the years. My friend, the other mother, sitting in the driver's seat, chimed in. Already at my age, actually, my friend is like just a couple years younger than me, but we're kind of the same age. She said, already at my age, um, I have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. We looked at each other. I shook my head. She'd held everything in her bones until it made her sick. I left school in ninth grade. I couldn't take it, she added. I dropped out after 11th grade. I offered as well. We looked at each other again, a way of holding each other. It's amazing that we have come this far in life, Mashke. But what a price we paid. What a price we agreed. 
sometimes I watch online lectures and presentations by Faith Spotted Eagle when I need uplifting. I highly recommend Googling her. <laughs> She's a beautiful speaker. Um, I enjoy her videos because of her advocacy for Native rights and also because she has a background in trauma and recovery. She offers useful knowledge about what's happening to me, to us. There's one video in particular that's helped me gather my thoughts and reflect on the importance of sharing and listening, the transformative chemistry. Her words are better than mine on this subject. So I'll close this portion of the essay with um, this quote from Faith Spotted Eagle. She said, when we talk about these losses and these traumas, it's important since the student body that will be watching this is Native and non-Native. It's important that we that when we talk about this, it is not to impart a sense of guilt. It's to impart a sense of freedom from denial. When you look at that trauma response, the Native people's objective is to heal. The non-Native people's objective is to come out of denial. And when these folks can come out of denial and these ones can start to heal, then they can start to come together on common ground. Okay, so I'm gonna jump forward to the hybrid portion of my um, essay, um, but I will just quickly summarize the rest of this to say that the rest of the essay talks about um, I volunteered to lecture at my kids school. So in this essay, I gave three presentations on um, the boarding school era. Uh, so I shared um, photographs and a lot of history um, some things from our um, language. Um, and I started by trying to connect the past with the present. I wanted the students to understand this is not something of the past. This is very present in who we are. For example, um, the recent discovery of uh, last year, they detected with radar 215 children at Kamloops Indian Residential School in Canada. Um, and since that, since that detection, it has grown to almost 10,000. Um, they have taken their radar and gone to other schools and that's only a fraction. If you can imagine, I mean, the waves, the ripples, the tremors it has created in our community. And it's actually not because it's, it's uh, shocking or surprising. It is because it is affirming all of the stories and all the things that our parents and grandparents said anyway, but they were never listened to. So this has been a recent development and something I, I actually, um, I've already presented at my kids' school. So um, this was something that I shared with them. So anyway, that's the rest of the essay. Um, and I also talked about our community, but I'm going to move now, excuse me. I'm going to share the PowerPoint of the second part and that's shorter, it's a hybrid, excuse me. Okay, sorry guys, I'm not very techy, so give me a minute. Second part of, can you see that metamorphosis? Okay, 
second part of my essay is titled Metamorphosis. I have like two pages of text and then it becomes filled with photographs. So let me see here just a second. Um, yeah, we'll do this. When we first heard about the discovery of 215 children's remains found at Kamloops Indian Residential School in Canada, you know, my child and I were rocked. Our faces flattened into paper maps, pockmarked by countless exits. All those child internment schools and our little ancestors. It felt strange as a mother to look toward the passenger seat of our car and encounter a 500 year sadness along my child's sweet mouth. All of us, our relatives, native friends and colleagues were shaken and rocked, shaken and rocked. We rode a seismic tremor through the land. Did you feel it? Three of my relatives could not speak about the subject. As in, they said, I can't talk about it. And their eyes watered with our words instead. To this, I am witness. I am supposed to be a person with a command of language, yet I refuse to command anything at moments like this, as this, this is a hanging crystal, at each edge sharper beam. Rage glints from this point, and as the crystal twirls, grief flashes next to crippling loss. And do you know that crystals are formed by slow, pressured, magmatic metamorphosis? I want to remind my relatives that the crystal's metamorphic essence is thus its greatest but I cannot say it. The word commands me to respect its privacy, protect its strength. What can I write anyway? What words have any? When a Milky Way of accounts have already been spoken, written, and prayed. Among the many, our beloved ancestor, Sint Kala Shah, wrote about her boarding school days. And when I read her pages, I read a story we already know. These accounts run like veins in the crystal of our land's bedrock. I highly recommend Sint Kala Shah's work if you haven't read it, by the way. Anyway, she wrote, <clears throat> Someone threw up the curtains, uh, Zint Kalasha wrote, and the, sun, and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to stoop and look under the bed, I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly, in spite of myself. I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick ribs. Then I lost my spirit. 
suddenly, my child and I, my child and I together, all that of our fields, what could we do but make? We began to move our hands wide. I don't know. We began to braid. Why? It is a mystery, except we had to. And so my kid and I were feeling very emotional during this time. And I had all these spools of um, fringe and really large spools in my house. And so um, we started to cut long strands and we just started to braid. We started making braids. We kept braiding with a firm hold, but, gen but gentle touch, quickly yet carefully, as if, uh, excuse me, as if each one was the hair of a niece or nephew braided in the morning before school. We kept braiding until we made 215. Then the braids asked for a form to hold them. So once again, I love form. You see here a roll on the table, a roll of um, window screen. I also love to work with window screen. <laughs> it's really moldable, really fun. It has a kind of translucence. And we began to attach those braids. You see there, I, we had silver caps and um, copper wire. We began to attach those braids to the, the end of the um, window screen. few mornings, Auntie Tilda came over to help us, us three generations making. This is my auntie. I just love her. Our words were unnecessary. It was more important to be together on the land, in our, we trusted the process, a gradual metamorphosis of our little braids into Do you see it? And so in the end, we ended up making a wing dress. This is like a older Lakota, Northern Plains style dress. And we attached all of those 215 braids to that dress. We trusted because we listened. Thank you, that's it. <laughs> Wopila, as they say. Thanks. I hope I didn't go too long. I'm sorry. You could have gone for like as long as you wanted, Lily. It was <laughs> magnificent. It was it was so very moving, and your your reading of it made it that much more impactful. 
do you, are you okay for us to take a few questions? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, folks, now is the time. If you haven't had a chance to put your question into the chat to go ahead and do so. Um, we have some practical questions like, is this essay published yet? So there's one we can start with. It, and you are, you are considering it an, an essay at this point, right? Yes, I would call it um, a hybrid essay, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, actually the off, there's a journal called The Offing and they publish poetry and some essays and hybrid stuff. So uh, I am working with the editor right now and they're working on layout and um, so on. So hopefully they're looking at next month, May, which right. is actually very close. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be, excuse me, that'll be online. And then you can read the portion that I didn't um, share tonight. Oh, I wonder, maybe I can talk to you about form while we're on the subject, because I, I think from what you've said, um, it seems to me like, and, and this is interesting to me too, in terms of your poetry, it seems to me like you, you must strive to just let the form kind of emerge organically. Um, you did say that you were, you were trying out couplets for that essay as well. So you must have thought it might go in a poetry direction at some point. So, I mean, how conscious of you are, are, are you of, you know, kind of manipulating the form or letting it emerge or how do, how are you thinking about form when you compose? Yeah, well, I mean, the main thing, I mean, what I often, I believe in myself and what I often tell my students, I view form and content as like two wheels on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. They have to be in balance they have to both be moving um, together. Uh, the, the bicycle or the poem is not going to move if one of them falls flat. Mm -hmm. So the form truly can transform a piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can like um, lift it to completely a whole other level, you know, depending on, yeah, depending on what you're doing. And so, uh, for example, I wrote a piece called 38, um, which is about the Dakota 38. And it's kind of a long piece, maybe like six or seven pages. And that piece took me like, um, honestly, almost two years to write. There was a lot of uh, research and um, decisions I had to make for that piece, but one of the biggest decisions was the form. It took me a long time to find the right form for the telling of that story. And in the end, what I finally came to after a few attempts and a few, I you know, working at it, with it a bit, I finally came to the sentence the very simple container of the sentence, the plainly stated, plainly punctuated, uh, standard, standard punctuation, this uh, container for a single thought. You know? mm -hmm. um, so, and then once, once the form came, then the whole thing began to move and I could really step, I, I, stepped into a kind of stride and I was able to really move forward and finish the work so thank you yes yeah, so the students who hear me say I don't think you found the form yet and go what are you talking about that's what I'm talking about right sometimes it it takes a while so we have a question from Lil Webb um and she's referring to some excerpts that, that I provided from Whereas. And she says, um, the, I, I think she's, she means the, the sensory images feel highly anatomical and even textural. How has placing significance on the sensations of emotions 
reaped by the memories addressed in your works aided your personal growth through writing? Has the retelling of these memories in, body, in a bodily or kinetic way allowed you to find or deepen an extension of the self, if that is what you seek? There's a number of ways I can answer this, but this I'll answer it in a way that I think is relevant to writing, my writing practice. So I think a lot of time, well, we all understand that like, first of all, poetry or writing is an art form, right? And it's very clear that like other artists, let's say visual artists, if you are a painter, your materials are what? Paint, canvas, what have you, you know, a surface. <clears throat> and so we do know that in, uh, in writing, obviously our material is language. That's the primary material that we're working with. Language is our paint. Okay. Now, I think sometimes when we call language a material, we don't always um, take its materiality seriously, but it is. It has a physical, chemical uh, uh, response, our, our body responds to language physically and chemically. We have a chemical response to certain words, to certain language. And so that language is connected um, we have a kinetic sort of um, connection to memory and to the words and the language we use to describe certain memories, if you will. And so um, to answer, I don't know if I'm answering this correctly, uh, the right way, but sometimes, let's say, especially in whereas, I did this and when I was addressing the apology, that national apology, and there were certain passages in that document that were troubling to me, I would sit and I would think, where do I feel that the most? Where do I, in my body, where's that feeling, that response centered? Where is it coming from? And then I would also sit and think of a, another experience, a personal experience in my life where I, it evokes that same chemical reaction, that same feeling. I don't know if that makes sense. And that helped me in, in being able to respond to that document. And so I have, for example, I, I have one passage where my kid um, comes in and and um, has fallen on the asphalt and is bleeding and is hiding um, their feelings, you know, just sort of laughing at the pain. And that was some, that's a very physical sensation that I recognize. And that was the same sensation I felt when I read that line. Um, I can't remember something about the, um, what was it? the arrival of Europeans opened a new chapter <laughs> in native people's life. When I read that passage, I had the same feeling um, can, in my body that I get when my kid or I are hiding our, our feelings. It's like, um, you know, that feeling of suppression, but there's so much beneath it. So I don't know if that's answering it, but it's certainly something I'm very aware of and use in my writing practice, um, being aware of that. Thank you. This is an important question from Kyra Foreman. With the next generations in mind, what form do you think advocacy will take in indigenous communities? You know, I really, I really can't say, I think that advocacy has to continue just on all fronts, to be quite honest, um, on all fronts. And we see that throughout, throughout the, around the globe and throughout history, that 
advocacy and pushing for change, it comes in from many, many directions. So we have the arts, the artists pushing and awakening consciousness, right? And then at the same time, we have lawmakers, we have legislation, uh, legislators, you know, pushing in other ways. Once, um, once the society or the country's consciousness is awakened, then we are ready for our lawmakers. We also have families at home just raising their children in a different way, you know, speaking about issues, uh, and making sure that their children understand issues in a relevant way and how to, you know, uh, show respect and how, you know, um, I don't know, to have these dialogues at home. So it's very hard for me to say how advocacy, what exactly, what form, I think it will continue to take many forms. I will say this, however, um, I just, I was just accepted to law school and I was um, working on a project. I was commissioned to write a piece for a film. And I was working on this piece titled uh, 135 X's. And I titled it in it, in it so I'm working with our treaty, 1868 treaty with um, the Northern nations, Ocheti Shakoli and the US government. But if you go to the end of our treaty, there are a hundred, that whole document is signed with X's by 135 of our leaders. And it's shocking, you know, even in, in present day, for example, present day real estate, this is the exchange in, in present day for, for land, right? If a contract is signed with an X, it is null and void. It is unacceptable in present law, okay? The, you cannot sign, but yet this is, we, we gave away huge swaths and signed under duress. So we know that history, it's very obvious. But our, one of our leaders, Red Cloud, who signed that treaty, he's famous for saying he was swindled. And he said, I was easy to swindle because I did not read or write in the English language. He was aware that that was how and that was why he was swindled and the other leaders. And so I was working on this project for a film and I woke up one morning and I said, it's in the language, in myself. I said, this legal language, this governmental language, it's a code. And I felt like I need to know that code. I need to know it because I feel like that, that's how much how so much wrong has been done, but I think that's how we can undo a lot of the wrong with that same language. The people who created that code, they're nobody, they're just people. They're no better than me or you or anyone else, okay? But it's very coded with because there's an intention behind it. So, um, I want to say, as far as advocacy in the future, I personally think part of it, uh, part of the advocacy and part of the changes we might be able to create is going to be through that language. Um, so I personally am invested in studying it this fall. I'll start my studies and I look forward to that. Congratulations on that, Lely. Can we take a couple more short ones? Is that okay? Um, one is a practical one, and it's from uh, Jan Millet Care. She says, I wrote my final essay on whereas for my MA in poetry at Manchester Metropolitan University, England, but couldn't find a link to your visual work to the link in to the text. 
As a visual artist, I'm hugely intrigued by your descriptions of the installations and interviews. So any information about getting, you know, links to the work would be appreciated, she says. I don't know. I don't have a lot. <laughs> I don't have them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a website and I don't have them compiled. You, I know that some of my work is uh, on Racing Magpie's uh, website. So Racing Magpie, I'm typing in um, Vera Gallery in Rapid City. And there might be some of my, I'm not sure, but I've had other work at um, the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School. You could look there. I don't know if they have any images. I will say that I'm working on my second manuscript. I'm trying to finish it now. And that is actually what will be in that book all in one place is um, photos of my ex installations and exhibitions, and then the text that has come from that visual work. So at some point I'll have it all in one place and then I can share it with you, I'm sorry. I'm not very good at keeping track of things, so. <laughs> I like to make things, but I'm not very techie or well, I'm sure we look forward to seeing it in the book. Let's just ask one last question. Uh, beyond Faith Spotted Eagle, are there any other creatives who inspire you specifically those with a native focus? Maybe you have some, some folks you could mention for us. Um, yeah, well, gosh, lots, you know, a lot of them are peers, people my age or younger. Um, I. I'm certainly inspired a lot and const constantly thinking about and looking at uh, uh, other Lakota artists. One of my favorite, I'm typing it, is my friend Diani Whitehawk. She was just in the Whitney Biennial um, this year. Uh, she made, so if you go and find images at the Whitney, uh, she made this monumental piece. It's like epic. It took her, I think, a year and a half to make. Uh, I think it's like 14 feet wide and like eight or 10 feet high, something like that. Completely beaded, 100% bugle beads. It is stunning. And it was at one point she had 17 assistants helping her. But in the end, it is 100% Lakota made, Lakota uh, symbols. And, you know, beneath that, of course, is our philosophy, everything that we are. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but like, when I saw when they posted pictures, like the morning of the, or the day of the opening, and I, I literally cried. I could not believe, like, I just could not believe that she had pushed this, given birth to this piece, you know? <laughs> so much work, so much detail, and like perfection, perfection. So, I think it's like, and Diani and I, for example, we're always, we talk a lot and we talk about, we work in different mediums, but we also talk, we sh what we share in common, for example, is like um, considerations, you know, certain, and I would say cultural considerations, you know, certain moves we might make, um, the impact it might have on community or relatives. So um, I, I, I gain a lot from, from those kinds of conversations. Um, I could recommend others, but I know that we're getting short on time. You've stayed longer than you intended to, and, and I appreciate it. It's, it's really been just an amazing evening. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Macy in a moment, but we just can't Thank you enough for your presence and for sharing your work with us. 
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> and Dr. thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please join me once more. We cannot thank you enough, Lele Long Soldier, for this extraordinary reading and discussion, um, which really, I, in such a powerful way, spoke to the materiality, the power of language, the transformative capacity of language as advocacy, as a way of understanding and changing, transforming, redeeming so much in our world. So thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity with your time and your writing. Thank you to our artist in residence, Wendy Barnes for putting together this wonderful evening. Thank you, Principal Chief Justin Wood for speaking to us and helping to frame this important reading. Thanks to all of our students, faculty, staff, community members. UCO President Patty Newhold, Ravi Kumar was able to be with us. Many folks from the wider community of writers, both here in Oklahoma City and far beyond the boundaries of our city and state. We're here and it's wonderful to see you all. We have much to think about during these, these coming days, this evening. I know what I'll be thinking about this evening. Take care, have a wonderful night, everyone. Uh, bravo, again, Laylee Long Soldier. Thank you, Laylee, thank you. <laughs> Good night, thank you.